Close with Robin Wolliver, mother of the Annie Moses Band, author, musician, and artistic director of the Fine Arts Summer Academy. Robin, how do music and the arts transcend the scope of entertainment to actually influence faith and culture? The arts are the single most influential voice in our society. And so much of it is not in keeping with the truths of God. And yet this generation is imbibing. I mean, they are we're walking around with those little white ear pods in. And that has so much more influence than one sermon or three songs on a Sunday morning. So we have got to begin to cultivate communities of artists, church to church, house to house, community to community, and then ultimately nation to nation. If we don't begin to root this new generation in the truths of God and to give them the artistic toolbox by which they can tout and express the love and the truth they know, then we can't begin to think that we are going to win the war of the worlds. How has the Annie Moses Band, comprised of your six children, inspired parents and children around the world to fulfill their own potential? The Annie Moses Band, as we have performed around the country, has inspired a lot of families. We have, sometimes we go back a second time to a venue to play and we'll have parents bring their little children forward and they'll say, my child has been studying violin since we saw you a year ago. That is thrilling to me. And the reason is that in our culture today, we have an educational system and the system doesn't necessarily recognize the bent or the God-given directive of a child or the destiny, the personal destiny of a child. And very often parents underestimate, they do not fully appreciate the talent or the gift within their child, the potential within their child. So we have all these little Beethovens and Mozarts that are running around our feet and their talents are unassessed when we inspire a parent to fully appreciate the potential of their child, that just, that thrills me. Um, because that means that the parent will perhaps find the path that that child was meant to follow and not just utilize the given systems of education, but to seek the ways of augmenting or even diverting away from those systems so that that child's special gifts are fully recognized and realized. I love that. Based on your own journey, would you tell us about the importance of cultivating a value for family? My husband and I have six children, three boys and three girls. When we first got married, that wasn't my plan. I was thinking I was gonna be a singer and I was gonna travel the world and I wasn't sure if I was gonna have children. But again, God sent me a moment. God is always sending those moments that if you're ready to receive them, will really change and impact your life. But I was talking to my friend, Tiny Sue, and, and she had just had a baby. And she said, when are you gonna have your first one? And I said, well, I don't know if I'll have any. She said, oh, you're gonna miss out on the very best. And that was all she said. It was that simple. And that darted me and in my heart. And I thought, you know, I know she's right. What am I thinking? So I set out and I thought, no, I'm gonna start having children. And then I got a, a second friend, Deborah, that gave me a book by a woman named Mary Pride. And it was called The Way Home. And I read that book and I realized that I had sort of, without even understanding or knowing it, not consciously, but somehow I had, I had bought in to this idea that you should only have two children. And I begin to think, where did that idea come from? Well, now I have a very deep historical idea of where it came from because I've studied that phenomenon. That why do we in America think we're doing the world a favor to only have two children? And right now, the major nations of the world are in a demise. It, we are not procreating enough to replace ourselves. And so I begin to see that that wasn't God's edict. So my husband and I began to pray and say, you know, let's just pray and see what God would bring us in children. And the more I, children I had, the more I came to understand that when you have a, a big family, you're not just creating 
mom and dad and the son and the daughter, the replacement theory that you'll have a son to replace the dad, you'll have the daughter to replace the mother, and thus the world moves onward. No, not I didn't buy that. So I, we began to have children. And I began to see how beautiful a family is because my mother, who had four of her, of her own, said, when you have the fourth one, it's no harder than the first three that, that you just keep adding and they're not any harder. And I found that to be true. Um, because by then, the family becomes its own society. Uh, I felt like I'd have to put up a sign-up sheet by the time I had the fourth and fifth and sixth because I rarely ever got to hold them. <laughs> no, we all fought over who got to hold the new baby. And you have all of this help, and that's what the family is all about. It's a wonderful, wonderful entity. Um, I home birthed. I nursed my babies for extended periods of time, and that creates literally a chemical bonding between the mother and the child, and that bond then later translates when the child goes out to find a spouse for life. And one of the problems we have in our society is a lack of bonding. We're fragmented. By the time a young girl gets married, she may have gone through a dozen boyfriends, and all she's learned is how to bond and break up and bond and break up. I didn't want that to be our paradigm, so I didn't do that. And so far, God has visited us on that in every way. My children that have gotten married have married the person that they dated, the very first one. And it's been a wonderful thing because we bond. Uh, having a large family, I highly recommend it. How can music uplift our culture and help spread truth, beauty, and goodness? Modern society has an approach to music that's not really very healthy because it, it attributes to only the elite few any musical space or any musical voice. And that's not right. Every living human being has a musical voice and they only need to learn what it is and how they utilize it. And we've, we've adopted an approach to music that says only those that are going into music professionally should uh, pursue musical interests. And that's not correct either. Music can be enjoyed in your parlor. Music is one of the major bonding factors of mankind. Literally, chemically, music bonds people. So what, the mother singing to her b newborn baby, that is a scientific phenomenon as well as a, an emotional phenomenon. Music should be everywhere. Music prepares the brain of a child for every other educational endeavor. And so why do we relegate music to this narrow little number of people? And my premise is, let's educate everyone musically. Then we'll have better doctors, we'll have better scientists, we'll have more creative culture at large. And as we do that, as we educate everyone musically, then these local and regional musical offerings can begin to rise up and teaching people how to create a coalition, an undergirding of a local music scene became a real important part of my thesis. Because historically speaking, the patron, for example, the patron of the arts was a major factor. If you look at all of the great works of music, it was because someone out there, the Medici family, someone said, I'm gonna pay you to create. And there are all these people out there that have a checkbook and a violin in their closet. And maybe they don't have musical opportunity in their old age or whatever, but there's a young girl like my mother that can sing like a lark, and, but the only place she can sing is the cotton patch because that's where her life has been relegated. And this connection of the patron and the needy child, it's very, very important. So finding the patron and then the pastor. The church is the richest musical entity in the world. Every Sunday, millions of people gather to sing in a church. It's very powerful. 
Singing releases oxytocin into the blood. It's the bonding chemical. It teaches people innately how they fit together. It makes them feel connected, united, generous toward one another. So it's an amazing reality. That's why the Bible tells us, sing. So it's important. But having pastors that understand the power of music, it's very important. And then having parents that understand the potential inherent in their child, how music builds the brain of a child, changes their life. It gives them a voice by which they can tout the truths and beauty of Jesus. And so having parents that appreciate their child's potential, it's very important. And then having highly skilled teachers, teachers who know the importance of their job, who are very methodical in their approach, who work in tandem with the parent to make sure the child has everything they need for success. Having that coalition in place, the parent, the pupil, the teacher, the pastor, and the patron, that will automatically pull in the public because when you have a stage full of young players that can flat play their instrument, they can sing like nobody's business, the public wakes up. They begin to say, I'm gonna go see that. And I know this is true because I've lived it. Robin Wolliver, thank you for being with Voice of the Vatican. For more on Robin Wolliver and the Annie Moses Band, go to www.anniemosesband.com.